Today, I'm on a quest to make an amazing, dry, traditional mead. Let's get started. Ah, look at that amazing mead. Wait, that's just stock footage. Uh, here it actually is. Much better. So I have a desire to make an amazing dry traditional mead, and I've, I've kind of wanted to do this for quite some time. This is actually a really tough task because you're really just relying on the good process you have in bead making, quality honey, what your yeast put into the brew, and oftentimes lots of, lots of time itself. So for this mead, I'm using a nice honey. I'm using Mamain Blossom Honey, which is a Hawaiian honey. And it has some apricot-like tropical-y flavors that I believe will be a great addition and great main character in a traditional mead, in a dry traditional mead. When I say dry, I'm talking uh, one point, I think it is 1.010 and below final gravity. Now we're going 1.000 totally. We're gonna make about 3.5 gallons worth of traditional mead with the recipe, and it's the recipe on screen with including my extra things I added at the end. So let's get started. So we're first gonna start by sanitizing all of our equipment. Watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out! After that, we can mix our honey and our water together. We can then add our yeast, which I'll talk about here in a second, and we take a gravity reading. So I started my gravity at 1.090 as the starting point. I am using the Omega Jovaru yeast, which on its little spec sheet says get up, gets up to 10%, but with proper nutrition, I was able to get this to go past 10%. We're looking at this brew being about 11.8-ish percent. I chose this yeast because it's a little bit different. I wanted to try it, but also it has some interesting characteristics. It's a farmhouse ale yeast and it promotes, and I'm gonna quote from their sheet, um, citrusy esters and restrained phenols you can expect lemon pith and black pepper character in a soft mouthfeel. I figured that would be interesting in this brew, so I pitched it in. I also d used a Tosna 3.0 schedule with my Fermade O to give this proper nutrients, of course. The brew took about 35 days to get to about 1.010. So I racked it over and I did a taste test. So here that is. All right, so this is after we have used dual fine. This is um, after the primary, after clearing. I, I did take, do a taste test after the primary part and it was a little yeasty and it obviously needed some things. Um, I don't have a totally accurate gravity reading, but here's a quick tasting. After it is cleared some, it doesn't look clear because the glass is frosted, but it, it is cleared, I promise. Um, I'll show you a better picture. This thing, that honey, it's super, super interesting. It uh, It's so uh, fruity and floral, tropical-y. I'm gonna keep this as it is. And um, I don't, my last uh, gravity reading was 1.008. I don't know exactly if that's true. I'll pop up the, the correct one. I gotta wait till this is cooled or warmed up before I get another gravity reading. This thing is so good. It's very, um, uh, it doesn't have a lot of tannic value, but the honey character and everything is nice. I think I'm gonna go ahead and oak it. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw some oak on it. I'll tell you what kind, kind of oak here in a second. After that taste test, I decided it was time to clear it up. And um, I didn't wanna just let it set for a long time and try to clear with time. So I used Dual Fine. Uh, Dual Fine honestly did a fantastic job clearing the brew, as you can see. I racked it over a few more times and just really made sure it was totally clear. At it's about five months in, I wanted to add some oak. So I added a medium toast French oak spiral for about, honestly, only three or four days. It was a very short amount of time. Each little oak spiral thing itself is graded for three gallons. So that's how I got my ratio. I found that that flavor imparted super quick. I didn't need much more time with it. I was very shocked, glad I taste tested it. So then I basically just pulled that spiral out of the brew. I also noticed that the gravity had gone down to 1.010 by the end, so this is completely flat, 1.000. I then decided, let's just let it set for some time. I mean, it tastes good. I don't wanna do a tasting point yet on video. At the point of this voiceover right here, this is five months old. Let's let it set for a while and come back. 
I did top it off with the little half gallon container that I had to make sure there was not much oxygen on top. Let's come back in a few months for a final tasting. All right, here we are, finale. This has been uh, a really challenging, but fun mead for me. Um, I have it right here, still in the three gallon carboy. It's very clear, so you can see, not as clear as it might have previously been. I think the oaking has affected a little bit of the darkness of it, uh, but it's still very clear. You can see, see my hand through it. I don't have one of those fancy photos of people reading a book out of their mead, but I bet you're wondering, what does it taste like post oak for a dramatic effect rather than me dump and pour from the carboy? That'd be really cool. I've got a little bit of it here. So, this mead is pretty dang clear. Pretty good looking. I love the coloring on it. Um, again, final gravity, 1.000. And uh, that is, that's dry. Uh, dry technically by the BJCP certification, whatever, is 1.010 and lower. So if we're going by those standards, it's even more dry than that. Now, sometimes mead can go, not, not very often, <laughs> go below 1.000. Oh my gosh. Yeah, the oak. So here's what's so crazy to me. I literally, I am so glad that I taste tested this with the oak on it um, after like two or three days. I've never had an oak spiral in part so quickly, but this one, it must have been on steroids or something because it, it's got full on oak character on the nose. Big uh, vanilla dark toast with like the undertones of um, tropical fruitiness that you get from the, the Mamein Blossom Honey. This definitely smells dry, but there is a smidge of sweetness that is just a little bit there, kind of helping us out. I really, I'm way pleased with how this has turned out so far. Let's taste it. Oh yeah. I mean, such a great level of oak to sweet, uh, not really sweetness, I'll say, perceived sweetness. I mean, it's got perceived sweetness here that's holding it, holding it down. It, it's, it's smooth, it's like, the tannins are nice, but it still has a little bit of wash. It's not like sandpapery gritty. And the, again, not sweet, but the honey character has retained a lot of its intrigue, which is important. Oh yeah, this thing is so freaking good. And I'm gonna keep it just like it is, meaning that as it currently stands, um, it is not stabilized. Now here's the thing. I am probably not gonna add potassium sorbate to this thing because I'm not looking to halt any yeast fermentation. There is none. There will be none because I will not be back sweetening. Now I will probably hit it with a little bit of potassium metabisulfite or Camden tablets pre-bottling to help ensure that the oxygen and the SO2 levels are adjusted to the correct parts per million so that it will age for longer. This thing I bet is gonna age beautifully and it just, I wanna ensure that it ages well. Golly. The, so, the yeast I used has that um, farmhouse kind of funk to it naturally. I don't get a lot of that, too much funkiness from that, which I'm thankful, but I do feel like it added, I can't quite explain the characters that the yeast added. They did not detract so far away from the base honey value itself that it, uh, it hurt it. Golly. Okay, freaking good. You could do any dry version with any dry mead with any version of honey, any kind of honey. So if you have orange blossom at your house right now, you could go and make a dry orange blossom mead. Here are the tips I would give you. Uh, make sure you, you use a yeast that is not going to blow away the honey character. So I would not suggest the, like a champagne yeast for the dry, traditional mead because you're relying on retention of honey character. Champagne yeast are notably there to just burn through all the sugars that it can. Um, 
something like that's not going to be great. I don't really know. I, I'm not going to, other than that, I'm not going to push you away from any other yeast because this one worked pretty well, surprisingly. And then my last little tip would be give it time. We are currently, uh, we're only six months out from the start of this thing, which is a long time granted. I'm kind of cutting this video project early because I actually need this carboy for an upcoming mead and I, I don't want to go buy more three gallon carboys. So I'm fine with bottle aging this thing. Um, I think it'll be just fine. In fact, I'll show you right now. I'm not going to do it in this moment, but I'll show you right now me bottling this mead so that you can see that. Of course, I'm bottling and putting labels and doing all my stuff on and then putting them back. Uh, I think this one's going to age really nice. I'm excited for it, but I, I need the carboy. That's basically where I was going. So if you give this thing proper yeast health, proper time to mellow, let your honey character shine through good yeast choice, of course, um, and tannin adjustment, you're going to have a pretty good product. And this is, this feels a little bit like I've kind of thrown a dart and I've somehow magically actually landed on a good product. This is hard to do. And I know I have good process to allow me to be able to do this right. And you should too, make sure you, you do all those things. But uh, I've really enjoyed getting to do this. I haven't had many, if any, really good dry traditional meads in my time tasting them from around. Um, I've had a couple of them, but I haven't really had a good commercial one yet. I, that's not true. I've had a couple okay commercial ones. This one, very, very good. And uh, I, I'm glad that I've started this. Uh, I had a, so I did a podcast with some people and one of the guys said, I told him about my escapade. Hey, I want to try and make a really good dry traditional mead. He said, do you like dry traditional meads? And I said, well, I mean, kind of. And his, his answer or kind of retort was, well, if you don't really like it, then why are you trying to like get really good at it or trying to make a really good one? And I think that people, that you as a mead maker should be making a variety of things so that your friends and your family who come over and taste test your meads can have options to try. Uh, if you're able to give them a, you know, the person who likes a dry traditional mead, a dry traditional, and the person who likes the sweet, a sweet, you're going to, you know, show off the world of mead more than if you just say, here's my only product. I only ever make apple and cinnamon meads, which was old me. Make sure you're making a lot of stuff. And it's also just fun. It's a good challenge. So I enjoyed it. I've enjoyed this video. I hope you have too. Be sure to hit like and subscribe and all those things for more content. And uh, I will see you again in the future with another project. So with that, cheers.